difference between the two? Um, the big difference yeah. in uh, that's more like fundamental question to uh, design bigger group of designer uh, who still uses SketchUp. Um, I personally don't use SketchUp, so I'm not probably the best person to compare to these two tools. Um, the focus on the conference really was the workflow between Formi to Revit. And there are other classes talks about like bringing SketchUp, but their focus is different. Their focus is like how to make designer to use um, any software they want and bring that to Revit. So the one that I show you is really like the, the workflow between for me to uh, analysis to Revit and going back and forth uh, through like this kind of one bucket tool. Like right now they are actually different under the na different names, but they re they are really connected. So I, I don't know if Which I, I will be talking question. about at my AU class. The yeah. difference between all those ways to force stuff into Revit. So I can also talk afterwards if you want. Cool, CBG, are you ready? Thank you, Dion. Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. All righty. It's yours. Okay, great. Can you see my desktop right now? We can. Okay, great. So first, I would like to thank everyone for coming in for the presentation. It's great to be presenting when there's a large number of attendees uh, hearing you. Thanks. So I'm going to talk about Space Plan Generator. Uh, this is a tool that I have been uh, developing for Autodesk. It's a package for Dynamo by which you can quickly generate masking options for uh, in the early stage of uh, conceptual design for any project. So before before I go ahead, I would like to give a brief introduction. I'm Supajit. I have a bit of a diverse background. I'm an architect by profession. I did MR design computing from the University of Pennsylvania and worked in a couple of firms in New York and Shanghai. Uh, in 2015, I finished uh, my master's in computer science at Georgia Tech. And since January, I'm working with Autodesk in collaboration with uh, Georgia Tech and Perkinsonville on this tool. And I will be starting a PhD in computer science uh, later this month. So, the whole presentation, uh, these would be the main points that I will be talking about. First, I will just give you a brief introduction of what space plan generator means. And I will show uh, how to access the package in Dynamo. Uh, then I will talk about SPD uh, data structure and algorithms. Uh, then I will build the SPD graph from scratch so you understand how different nodes and components work. And then I will demo how to input data into, the, into Dynamo uh, from a .sat and .csv file. Essentially, they are, they are the site outline and program document. Um, I will demo a Dynamo primitives library, which is a, a, a library written by Colin Day from uh, Autodesk Generative Design Team. And Space Plan Generator works on top of it. And finally, I will just talk about few in-progress functionalities which are not yet pushed in the package in the package manager in Dynamo, and I will demo how the uh, how those functionalities work. Yeah. So let's start. So this is a big rough process map of. Uh, just just want to clarify. You guys can hear me, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. So this is a process map that I built when I was starting uh, on a space plan generator project. So my idea was that uh, a space plan generator would be a system sitting in Dynamo, uh, getting the project to data information from the architect or the designer and in, uh, generate uh, design options in the form of uh, a mast, uh, massing of uh, programs uh, or uh, departments or very early stage uh, 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 stacking of blocks on the site just to show different ideas how uh, the project can be uh, uh, realized. So as an architect, I have been working on a lot of projects and I have seen myself uh, fitting with multiple design options early on, trying to figure out the best possible option which can satisfy clients' goals and objectives in the best possible manner. But as always is the case, there's this time constraint and you can only generate a certain number of options. 
So the large design space remains unexplored. So space plan generator is uh, for those uh, cases where you can generate a lot of options really quick and see where ahead, like how would it be if we would be designing it this way. So a space plan generator works with humans. Here humans would be architects and designers who would be evaluating the space plans and uh, uh, evaluating them based on certain goals and metrics. So these are a couple of use cases which I already talked about. Quickly generate massing options. Understand the program fitness to the site. So your client might have asked you to design a, a hotel with 300 rooms, but given the uh, building code regulations, you cannot fit more than 150. So how can you prove that really quick? So space plan generator could be a good uh, tool to do that. Then you can compare different space plans by scoring against set goals, and these goals would be the goals uh, given to you by the client, probably maximize hotel rooms or minimize uh, nurse travel distance, things like that. And then when you have a certain space plan which uh, somehow uh, satisfies your criteria, you can export the space plan from Dynamo as a DWG with each space labeled, and you can work on top of it. So that's the whole uh, workflow that was uh, part. Another very interesting use case could be uh, the implementation of machine learning, which is essentially uh, trying to learn from uh, all of the space plans that are generated. And every time you generate a space plan, you score it, and uh, basically you generate a lot of uh, data. So machine learning is really handy when you have a large data set, and you can always uh, classify those space plans as good or bad uh, for certain projects or certain uh, sites. So in those cases, machine learning could be uh, implemented on top of space plan generator. So in future, you can really tell that this space plan works and this does not. So some of the expectation from the tool would be you can just feed in project information and hit a button, and in about 10, 15 seconds, it would generate a design option for you. Uh, it will quickly stack and explore different ideas. But one uh, important thing is that this, this will not generate a finer, final floor plan for you. It's just an idea generating tool. So it gives you different directions, but you still have to work on top of it, uh, fine tune things, and, work, uh, and make it polished to be a uh, uh, architecturally realistic tool plan. So I work from the Atlanta office uh, uh, in collaboration with Perkins and Wells Healthcare team, and they provided me this project of uh, adding a new bed tower, which you can see over here, uh, on an existing hospital site. So my job was to use was to develop space plan generator in such a way that I can satisfy some of the client goals that I've listed here. For example, maximizing patient beds or minimizing view restriction to the existing south block of the site, which is over here, or maximizing connectivity with the existing hospital. So these are the few design options that the team uh, at the other office from Wilkinson will generated, but these are all manual options, so they could only go a uh, certain uh, uh, number of options to explore. So that's where space plan generator would uh, make a good use case. So let's uh, explore a uh, package in Dynamo. So you can see my uh, Dynamo screen right now. Uh, not yet. Okay. So I'll wait. There we go. We can see it. Okay. So if you just go open Dynamo Studio or Dynamo, you can go to package and search for a package and just type in uh, space planning, and you will find it right here. So I, I make changes to it in, uh, in few uh, intervals of time. I always update the package. The latest one was on August 5th. Uh, so I will, today I will uh, demo a couple of graphs uh, which has functionality which is in progress right now, which is not pushed into the package. And some of the functionalities I will show which is already in the package. So when you will explore the package yourself, you might find something missing that I have shown today. But uh, don't worry, I will push new changes very soon. So when you uh, install space planning uh, package, you would see something like that on the left panel. And it has uh, uh, two components underneath it. The first one is a space planning package which I uh, developed. 
And the second one is the Dynamo Primitive uh, Package, which was developed by Autodesk Generative Design Team. And I will demo what this works and how uh, this uh, really expedites the whole computation to uh, make a lot of geometrical uh, uh, computation uh, to generate uh, space uh, planning. So coming back uh, to the PowerPoint, so can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Okay, so the whole uh, this space plan generator works on a very simple uh, sequential uh, steps. The first step is that you have a site outline. The black outline shows the site here, and the dots represents uh, entry points. So you get the site outline from uh, the user, and you get the uh, entry points to the site from the user as well, and you place grid cells on top of the site. Then, uh, from the program document that the user will treat as an input, uh, you can find the departments or zones. Departments are basically a collection of programs. And then you can place the departments on top of the site. And the third step could be you can place programs inside those departments, like you see here. And the fourth step could be you can place circulation networks between the departments and between programs. So that's how you generate a whole uh, space plan. So. Since it's a generator, it needs to go different ways to find uh, different uh, design options for the same set of input parameters. You can sometimes shuffle these uh, steps. So you can go one, two, three, four, or you can go one, two, four, three, meaning you can generate circulation first and uh, place programs later. Or you can generate circulation first, then you place department, then you place programs. Each uh, uh, mechanism would lead to uh, uh, different space plan options for the same input uh, uh, variables from the user. So what I just described in the previous slide, I have just uh, listed here. You get the site context. You draw a grid on the site. You place building entries. You place departments. You place programs inside the department. And then you make a circulation network. Uh, the one thing that was missing over here is that you're using the whole site uh, as a building outline, but that is not how architects work because we have uh, building code regulations in the form of site coverage. So, like, you can only cover 60% or 70% of the site. So, thinking of that, I implemented a form maker component into the whole a sequence of operation. What it does is that it gets the site coverage as a user input and finds the best possible uh, form or building outline on the site that can uh, uh, feed the departments and programs and the circulation network. So I will not go into the detail how it works, but essentially it uh, leverages the cell data that's placed on the site, finds the uh, outline, like outer cell cells, and then traverses them to find the orthogonal uh, site outline, and then uh, finds uh, wholesome polygons in the form of rectangles or squares and merges them together till it satisfies the uh, area requirement uh, to, uh, to uh, satisfy the site coverage, which is the user input. So these are some of the early uh, design outputs from space plan generator. So on the bottom, you can see it takes the whole uh, site outline as a form and places programs and circulations in it. And on top, you can see uh, it has generated a building outline inside the site. The black, black line here represents the site. And every option has different site coverage, 65%, 73%, 42%. So you can basically uh, test how, how much site coverage would actually be adequate to fit the program requirement from the client. So the next, I will talk about uh, the data structure that I'm using uh, for a space plan generator. So it essentially uses uh, two uh, uh, major inputs. One of them is the .csv file, which is the program document. And another one is .sat file, which is uh, the site outline. So I can show you the program uh, document and how it uh, works. You guys can see uh, an Excel document. If not, you can just tell me I will stop. So this is the program document that I'm using for all the demos that I will be doing today. The first field is the program ID. 
uh, it is essentially gives an ID number to every program. The second field is program name. The third field is the zone or department for the program. And then you have quantity area and total area requirement for the program. Uh, and you have preference value. Uh, a field which essentially lets the system know which program is of higher importance for the user than the other. So it is rated from 1 to 10, uh, 10 meaning it's of higher preference and 1 meaning it's of lower preference. So this is essentially to give uh, the system a cue to uh, place the programs uh, sorted in the way the preference values are set. So if the area is not adequate enough to place all the programs, it will place the more preferred program first than the other one. And similarly, uh, you have program typologies. And program typologies are basically uh, telling the system uh, what kind of program each uh, program is. So for example, uh, at this level, I have three uh, cl uh, classification of pro uh, programs. One is K KPU, KPU meaning uh, key planning unit. So key planning unit uh, for a space plan would be the most important uh, unit of the space plan. It would be modular and it would have its own uh, length and uh, width requirement. For example, for a bed tower, a patient room would be a key planning unit. For a school, a classroom would be a key planning unit. So these are some of the characteristics of a key planning unit. It has to be modular, it has to be required in large quantity, and it has to have a certain length and width requirement. Anything which is not, uh, and also uh, it has to have an access to an external wall to catch daylight and external view of uh, accessibility. Then you have a uh, program type public, which essentially uh, informs the system that these programs allows the uh, user to get into the site. So for example, uh, get into the building. For example, lobby uh, is a public program type. Uh, family lounge could be a public program type. And public toilet would also be allocated in the public program type. And anything other than KPU and public would be regular programs. And then, uh, Next, what I do is that I let the user place adjacency requirements for the programs. And this field is totally optional. User, if they do not have any clue or any requirement, they are free not to feed any information here. But putting any information here, what the user tells the system is that this, uh, for example, if I'm talking about program ID 9, which is offstage uh, work area, and I'm saying 463, that means program ID 9 needs to be next to four, program ID 4, program ID 6, and program ID 3. So these are some of the ways how you can let the system know uh, your uh, adjacency requirements. You can also place uh, the requirements for the department level. So you have uh, different department IDs for each department. So the first department, family, public support, is department ID 0. The next one is 1, 2, and 3, which is inpatient area, exam area, clinic support, and shared staff support. So you can also place adjacency of department IDs as uh, family, public support needs to be next to IDs 1, 2, and 3. One is inpatient area, two is exam uh, area, and three is probably shared staff support. So how SPG works is that it first looks into this field, and then it looks into this field and then derives its adjacency. I have a couple of slides in my presentation uh, to show how uh, I compute the adjacency and then try to place the program next to them. So, yep. so that was uh, about uh, how I get the program document uh, in the system. And uh, now, uh, it is how I get uh, the site outline into the system. So the site outline essentially is uh, brought into the system as a .sat file, uh, which is essentially you can export from any uh, uh, any software like AutoCAD or Rhino. So for example, I can uh, show you here. You probably can see my uh, Rhino viewport. So I can make an uh, outline like this. And for the space plan generator to work, it's essential that this should be exploded. So every line should be separate. And then you can select all of them together and 
go into file export and select dot sat so i have already of these to sh show in the demo so the whole workflow is you just have to make a site outline or you already might have as a dwz you can export that as a dot sat and get that into uh dynamo so i can quickly uh, uh, demo how that works in dynamo so this is uh some of the base, uh, base level inputs that I need to have for space plan to work. First is the program document that I talked about. You can just copy the .csv content and place in a string node and then feed that into the uh, space plan generator. And also you can provide a path to the .sat file and feed that into uh, the space plan generator. So let me show you how to bring the data in. So first what you do is that you go into space planning over here and you can see multiple uh, uh, objects here. So to get to read the data, you have to go into the read data class and in here you will see uh, make data stack from string. What this does is essentially it brings the program uh, content of the program document uh, into the system. So what I can do is that just feed the string into the program document string uh, input and there you go. So what it does is that it builds department data object, which essentially is one of the primitive data uh, component used while uh, generating space plans. So if you want to see that the program document content was successfully imported or not, you can always uh, go into department data object over here on the space planning uh, panel. And these are the different uh, data that's, that resides inside the department data. For example, I can go into find how much area was needed for each department. Right now I have five departments. So I can place it here and I can see that I have five departments and each of them the area requirement is this. I can find the department name by feeding the same uh, information over there and see that these were the department uh, names. So things like that. There's also other information. All of this is brought into Dynamo from the CSV file. Mm -hmm. so this basically shows the type of uh, depart each department type. So inpatient area was a key planning unit, which had patient rooms. Then you have clinic support, exam area, and shared staff support. They were all regular departments. And then you have family public support, which is a public uh, department. So your is built from the program document. The next thing uh, you need to do is to get the site outline. What you need to do is that you go into uh, read data again and go into uh, get site outline from SAT, which basically brings the uh, out, uh, dot .sat file into uh, Dynamo. So for example, I have already uh, have a uh, a site outline here I can put in over there and you can see you can already see you have a site outline on the viewport. So when you have the site outline and you have the program document in Dynamo you're all set to start working on stacking uh, design options. Now the interesting thing about space plan generator is that it works on top of dynamo primitives library which is essentially uh, uh, this piece in the package what it does is that it computes all of the geometry objects without generating the geometry on the viewport so if it has to uh, compute on a point object, it will not generate a point on the screen. It will just generate the X and Y coordinates. So essentially what it does is that it boils every uh, geometry object to numbers. So a point will essentially be just a X comma Y information. It's just a set of double. A uh, line would be set of two points. Essentially it will be four numbers. So I have a uh, some examples here. For example, if it's this is a point 2D dot y coordinates, comma x comma y here. X and y were given one and one. So it gives you a point 2D object, which essentially is a, a collection of two numbers. But you can always convert that into a regular native 
dynamo point by this uh, node point by point 2D and you can see the point is right over there on uh, the viewport. So I can, I can play with it and you can see that that point is over there. So it does with everything for line, for polygons, for everything. So that's what, what space plan generator works on top of. So, when it, so all of the computation is at the number level, so you do not generate any time frame. That's why uh, each space plan design output is really fast. So you can see in the demo, each design option should not take more than 15 seconds or so. So once you have the program document or the site outline, the next thing uh, that you need to do is that build an orthogonal site outline instead of a curvilinear site outline because uh, space plan generator right now works on only orthogonal polygons, uh, only polygons which are at right angles. So you can uh, again go back to uh, read data and what you can do is that first you have to convert uh, the site outline into a polygon 2D which I just explained uh, why we have to do because this is going to work on top of Dynamo Primitives library. So what I do is that I just placed place the geometry uh, that I get from the get site outline into convert site outline to get the polygon 2D. And now I'm going to I'm going to convert this curvilinear polygon 2D into an orthogonal polygon 2D. So I go to grid object over there and find find ortho site outline. So what it gives you is uh, orthogonal uh, side outline. So you cannot see anything. All you have can see is dynamo primitives object. The only way to visualize what you have got is you can use converter which converts the dynamo primitive object back into dynamo native object. So what I can do is that I can make a polygon from polygon 2D. So what I did was I did that and I can see the polygon right on the screen. So this is the closest uh, uh, polygon, uh, orthogonal polygon for this site. So I'm going to use this to place the program instead of, uh, instead of the site outline. So the next uh, step would be to generate a form based on a site coverage. So you go back to grid object and you will see a form building outline. So what it does is that it, it builds a form around the site uh, based on the site coverage you provide. So there's two ways to go about it. You can manually provide a site coverage, or if you do not provide, it will compute from the area requirement of, in the program document. So basically, you can see uh, both ways. If uh, if you would just want to play, yeah, what happens if I increase the site coverage? You can see uh, the space stacking options. So for the form building outline to work, what I do is I provide this ortho site outline into the ortho site outline of the form building and provide some cell information into uh, the form building. So I get the cell list and provide it here. And I've got the form building outline. If you are curious about what is this cell list, you can always visualize that again. You can go to make cells from cell list and you can show here. So this essentially populates a grid cell into uh, the site outline. So if I look back to the PowerPoint, I can show you that the cell object is the basic uh, uh, object which helps uh, uh, compute uh, the spatial allocation in the site. So how you, it essentially helps you understand what uh, part of the site would be appropriate for what kind of program. For example, it helps you understand the external wall of the building outline. It helps you understand uh, which uh, corner of the site your program is located in. It also gives the user the liberty to uh, set certain weightages for certain sites. For example, you can say, this area of the site is good for daylighting because there is no tree. So you can set some weightages for this cells for daylighting and the space plan generator would understand that this area is better for daylighting so it would put all the programs which needs daylighting uh, in these uh, locations. So these are some of the ways how it does. I'm not going into the technicalities much, but uh, essentially what it does is that it builds a cell neighbor matrix and traverses the site to find the most appropriate location to place program. And all of that, you can see, uh, all of that information resides in the cell data object, uh, uh, which I can show in the Dynamo itself. So if you go to cell data, you can see 
cell area, cell availability, cell IDs and all that. All of this information about each cell resides here. So moving on, the next thing that I need to do after building the form is to place departments. So what I do is that I go into uh, uh, build layout over here and you can see uh, place departments. So what it does is that it gets uh, the data from the program document in the form of department data which is done with the help of this node. So it place this department data object into the place department and it needs a building outline. So we have already generated the building outline so you can place it here. And it needs uh, a factor point. I will uh, discuss what this point does. Uh, for now, I just uh, plug in the point that I have already uh, built. And then next, what it, what it would need is the uh, KP2 depth list. So what KP2 depth list is basically uh, the number of KPU department you have, and for each department, which are set as KPUs, you can provide the depth uh, of it. So if I go back to uh, the PowerPoint and go back to a couple of slides back, so essentially this dimension is the depth. So the user can provide that. So I can uh, feed in uh, this information. You have you have placed your departments, but everything is in uh, Dynamo primitives uh, and department data object state, so you cannot see anything. Visualize what you have built. You can go into space analysis and go into visualize uh, departments, and what you can do is just plug right there. So what you see is that these are the different departments that you have placed. So the green one is the KPU department, which needs an external wall. So it's got an external wall and placed it there. And the rest of the departments are regular departments. So they were placed uh, along the center because it doesn't care about external wall. You can also check how much area each department needed and how much was placed. So what you can do is go to department data and then uh, go into department area needed. So what you can do is that place it here and see this was the amount of area for each department that was needed. And you can check from here department area provided. So you can compare how much was needed and how much was provided. So you can see that you needed 8,228 uh, square feet of uh, inpatient bed area, but 11,397. So this is what's uh, space plan generator does, tries to approximate different variables that you have set in and tries to uh, get as close as possible to the area. Sometimes it might not be a able to generate all the departments, but that is something which you can always play with by generating different design options. So how you can generate different design options is uh, you can provide a design seed value, which is essentially like a catalog number. Uh, for the space plan generator to generate different designs. So you can say, I want to see design number one, and it will recompute uh, the whole thing based on the same input variables and give you a new design output. So if I plug in there, you see you have a different design option. If you change it, it will be different. And you can keep on changing, and it will show you different stacking options. You can al also give a uh, custom uh, site coverage instead of having it compute from uh, program documents. If I say I want to see 60% uh, uh, site coverage building on the site, it can show you different possibilities. So this is what it does. It quickly gives you different options uh, without having you to draw it from scratch. And then you can compare the area, was it satisfied or not. It could not be satisfied because the site coverage was way too less. So, so Jeremy, am I doing good in terms of time or should I speed up? Uh, where is he? <laughs> <laughs> um, you're doing okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yep. So you have placed departments. The next thing you need to place is place uh, programs. 
So if you go back to build layout, you can see place program uh, node. What it does is that it uses these departments and places programs inside them. So you need to use the department data from the place department and place it over there. And this time what it needs is the program width list. So here width means uh, for the kit, you, the width means uh, this dimension, the lateral dimension. The first, when I was placing the department, I provided this dimension, and when I'm placing the place, I'm giving this dimension. So that's how it knows what should be uh, the aspect ratio. So what I can do is that I can just uh, feed in this value into place programs. And you have placed programs. Again, this is in Dynamo Primitive uh, Department Data Objects world, so you can't see anything, anything that you've generated. So you have to visualize what you have generated. So what you can do is that go back to uh, space analysis and use to visualize department and programs together. So what you can do is use that department data node and feed in there and, you can, and turn on the preview. And you can also need to use the visualize polylines and origin over there. So what you can do is that place the department data over there. So this essentially shows you how your space plan might look like. So these are the different KPUs. In this case, it was inpatient uh, bed. It could be classroom. It could be retail. It could be anything which needs external wall or the, is the main component of the uh, of the site. And you can always keep on changing the catalog number to find different design output. So you see it keeps on generating different designs without having you to draw all of these layouts one by one. So that's how it works. So the big pieces of, uh, of the whole system are, if you go from the left, you first got your data stack developed from the program document, you got your site outline in, you made an orthogonal site outline approximate line over here, then you build the form, then you place departments, so these are the big pieces, and then you place the programs. So you build form, place departments, and place programs, and you have uh, 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 site plan, uh, space plan. And then you use these nodes to visualize what you have gotten here. So I can quickly show you a file uh, which is uh, in a bit more uh, refined state to show how things would look like. So this is the same uh, graph and the same nodes, uh, just a bit more sophisticated and all the nodes and inputs are placed in. So it's a, it does the same thing, you get your input from the user. It builds a data stack, builds a form, places department and program, and then visualizes that. And also it places circulation network. So if I go into the space plan, you can see all the SAM colored networks. These are all the circulation. So the circulation is a bit uh, uh, approximated right now. It's not very accurate, but the newer version of the package has a better circulation generation, which I will show in the next. Uh, demo in a while. So some of the things that I wanted to show is that there are different ways you can use uh, uh, the form generation tool. For example, you can you can place uh, certain uh, pointers or attractors and say that this area of the site is not available to build any form. So what you can do is that you can play with the weights of two points. So what it does essentially is that you have two points and it places uh, two circles and it will protect, it will basically prohibit the form to approach uh, the site over there. So you basically have to push them into the site so that you can see, uh, yes, it's over, it's over there. Yeah, so see as soon as I put it over there, the form would not go into that location. So when I'm placing these two over here, the form would not go there. So it will give you different options. Uh, it, what if you cannot build here? If there's a feature, a prospect 
infrastructure building, a parking deck here, or something like that. So these are some of the things that architects always deal with. So the form generator tool uh, gives you a handy opportunity to uh, do just that. And then again, you can always play with the design catalog number to find different design options for the same uh, input variables. So this was uh, the higher level uh, overview. And then the next thing that you need to know is that what are each of these programs are, right? So you can, what you can do is that you can place uh, labels on top of them and read what's in there. So essentially what it says is that every, uh, every uh, program is named ID, so you can always refer to the actual document, so it was ID set 3, and it has some initials of the, uh, of the program name, so it's, it was for a patient room and the department was inpatient, so it has uh, in, uh, attached to it. So that's how you can always compare what was placed and what was not and what and how uh, it, how it uh, looks like. And you also have uh, some design metrics to compute the fitness of this uh, space plan. So you have, uh, for now, I have placed these uh, four metrics. For example, the first metric is program fit score, which essentially tells you uh, how much was the requirement of the program and how much was placed. So if you have 20,000 square feet needed to be placed in, and you can only place 10,000 square feet, so it will compute that and give you a score. Then you have external view score, which says that how many key planning units actually gets external view. For this case, it's 100 because all of them gets uh, external view. Then you have travel distance score, which essentially is that from any of the support space, how far, how long would it take, uh, how, how far is the key planning unit? Right now, it uh, computes the distance from center to center, but eventually it will use the circulation to actually traverse the route and compute that. But right now it's just a placeholder to see that in action. And then uh, you have KPU proportion score, which essentially talks about uh, out of all the program uh, that you have fit in, how much is the key planning in it? So how many short shops were you able to place in the shopping mall that you have designed? So that is one of the key uh, metrics that architects always need to know. So these are some of the scores that uh, the program generates, and the user can uh, key in their weights. So what it does is that it uses the space plan fitness test uh, uh, node from the space analysis. So you can go there and see space plan fitness test. It uses the department data from the place programs, the cell list, and the site area. And the user can place these four uh, weights. So how it works is that you can wait from zero to uh, uh, 10, and you can say uh, which one matters to you more or less. So that's how you can say that I do not care about how much program I'm in. What I care is if all the KPUs got external view or not. So these are some of the means how you can weight them and tell the system that what matters to me more. And then for each design option, it gives you a uh, a card like this design has this this much design uh, score, so this is better than the previous one or worse than the previous one based on uh, your uh, design goals. And then also it computes the number of key planning units placed. For this case, it was 23. So this this graph essentially uh, shows you uh, uh, the the package uh, the content of the package uh, version uh, 1.0.43. So, but I have been working on this uh, a bit, and there are uh, new changes. Uh, I will show you in the next uh, graph. And I will show you the working behind these uh, nodes, like place departments or place programs. So let me open this one. Yeah. So in this graph, what I have uh, is I have the red as the public department. So essentially it's a lobby or a entry lounge or a way to access this uh, building. And also the red encroaches in this building as corridors and everything else is separate departments. So what you can do is that, uh, like we explained in the previous graph, uh, there's an attractor point. So I can play with that attractor point 
place the building entry in different places. So for example, if I change this, so right now the building entry is placed here. Essentially you can see where the attractor point is. So right now the point is over here, so it will find the best closest possible uh, area where you can place the building lobby. So right now the tractor point is over there, so it placed it here and placed uh, all the key planning unit, units and other departments over there. And you can also uh, play with different, uh, uh, different site outlines. So for example, I have uh, placed a couple of uh, .sat files. I can test the same program in a different site. And for this case, it didn't work. So that's how space plan generator works. Every time it tries to generate a design, but sometimes it might not uh, be successful. So what you need to do in then is just uh, change the design seed value. So the value that you see over here, you can always change, and this will try to generate a different design option. So this is a very nice use case of the space plan generator. What it did was I provided a much bigger site and the program requirement was much lesser. So what you see is that you see a lot of white spots because the program ex expected program was way less uh, than the whole site and that's why it, it could not place it uh, in an acceptable way. So that's uh, how you have to tweak with uh, these values and find different design options uh, and find uh, uh, appropriate space plan uh, for you. Uh, for in this uh, uh, new uh, version, some of the changes that I have proposed is uh, better circulation network finder, uh, placement of public department based on the tractor point that you have placed, and uh, different uh, department typologies, which I will explain in a bit. So the place department mode that I just showed you in the last uh, graph. Uh, this this graph basically explodes that out. So what it does is that first uh, it will place department, which is this red piece. Then it will place a circulation next to it. Then it will place the KPUs. There could be more than one. And it will place circulation next to it. Then it will place regular departments. And again, it will place circulation next to it. And when, when you have all of that placed on the side, it will feed that into the department data object. And the department data object is essentially uh, is your basic uh, means of uh, visualizing uh, the whole piece uh, on the site. So you can, you can change uh, your input parameters. You can change uh, uh, your width and depth of each, and you can see uh, uh, what it gives you. So for example, I can change uh, KPU depth, and it should see you have gotten a uh, deeper key, key planning units over there. So that's how it works. You can quickly uh, make changes and see uh, uh, what would be the ramifications. You do not have to uh, redraw everything and then compute. You can also change the uh, width of uh, uh, these rooms as well. And, uh, there's another thing that it does is that it's good to uh, visualize uh, the whole thing uh, in 3D. So you can also test uh, uh, the massing and see how it works uh, in the site. So you can you can quickly go back and change it to a different site, and you can see what could be uh, the design option for the same site. So for this case, it generated something like that. It gives you corridors and the rooms, and you can always go back to see uh, how the space plan looks like. So you can go back and turn off the preview for all of this. Yeah. And that's how it looks like. Uh, the same thing uh, works on the previous graph. I forgot to show one thing. Let me go back. Yeah. So there's a sweet little mode called Mode 3D. What it does is that it lets you uh, place departments on different uh, levels. Uh, and then you can see how that works out. 
So that mode is still under work, but it gives you a rough idea how different departments can be placed. You can set the total building height. You can set the number of departments for each level. You can set uh, the building height for each uh, floor. Uh, let me quickly turn off the space labels, and then uh, you can see how it works. So essentially, uh, it can be kept used on the periphery for all the levels, but for each uh, department, it changed. Uh, uh, for each level, it places different departments and shows you different possibilities. So this is on a higher level how space plan generator works. Let me quickly go back to the PowerPoint and see if I missed out on anything. So. Coming back to the data structure, what uh, I have cell data, I have department data. These are some of the building blocks of space plan data structure. And on top of that, uh, the space plan data structure is uh, internally uh, builds a binary tree. What it does is that uh, every time you try to assign a department or a program, you're basically making a split on the site outline or the building outline. So that outline is called container, and every time you split it, one part of that can be allocated to a space. So that goes to the left node, which you can see here is the gray node, and the other part which is left over is a container node. So the container node is always in the right node. So the container node is further available to be, to be split. So when you split the container node again, for example here, you will allocate one part to the space, and another part is again available to be split further. So this keeps on going, but every time you split it, you essentially save the department data and the splitting line. So this splitting line is uh, what's helpful to uh, generate circulation network with different, between different departments or between different programs. And also the whole history uh, of splitting is uh, stored and saved. So you can go, always go back up the tree or go down the tree and uh, see uh, and uh, uh, compute uh, space plan fitness. So this is some of the higher level idea behind the data structure adopted. And this is the rough state of the graph which I showed you. Each node here is developed in C-sharp. So basically these are the different classes that I have. So for example, I talked about department data. So this is a separate class. It has all the object and information stored in. So for every piece of, uh, uh, every component that you saw is essentially a C-sharp class. So there's a build layout class which has all the information. Uh, there are a lot of behind the works uh, function going on which the user doesn't know. But for example, there's a place departments uh, node. Depending on the mode you have selected, it computes 2D or 3D, stuff like that. So this is how uh, it works. I talked about the space plan analysis nodes, how it computes and gives a, a scorecard for each space plan option. And then you have a bunch of space plan uh, options as an output. So Perkins and Whedon Autodesk collaborated uh, in July to workshop in Boston. Uh, uh, there was uh, multiple teams of two people formed. Uh, one would be a computational designer, another would be a planner or an architect. And they tried and tested a uh, space plan generator, trying to generate different design options on real projects. For example, this was a pro child care center project in New York. So on the left, you will, you're seeing uh, actual space plan, and on the right, you're seeing something that was generated by space plan generator. So um, there are also a couple of more design options that they could uh, get out of it. So this was, this was a great session. I got a lot of uh, uh, valuable feedback, which I'm right now in the process of implementing to refine this tool further to let it generate a more realistic space plan uh, so that it's more useful for architects to be used right away. So some of the added features uh, which are right now in progress are I have added new department typologies, which I'm going to explain next. Uh, I have added better department adjacencies. Before, uh, architects could only provide adjacencies between program, but now they can also provide adjacencies between different departments, so that's m more convenient. Uh, then you can also, in this uh, version, you can compute the site coverage from the program document. You do not have to manually feed in. Uh, then it supports multiple key planning units with different width and depth uh, requirements. 
and then it computes uh, adjacency weight computation based on uh, these different KPUs and different department typologies, which is new. And then it develops a department and program assembly to satisfy that the synth is needed. I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. And the newer uh, uh, version also has better circulation generation between departments and programs. Another thing that I forgot to mention here is that it also classifies one of the departments as public and lets the user allocate or locate the public department uh, on the uh, space plan. So some of the department typologies that I have created right now is one of them is public, which is the main entry exit point to get in the building. Then you have key planning units, uh, which needs external window. Right now, you can uh, you can place multiple key planning units. Then you have regular uh, departments which does not which do not care about external window, but they are still modular like key planning units. And then you have regular support spaces which needs to be distributed with the key planning units. For example, cleaning rooms or living rooms. So after a certain number of uh, key planning units, you need to place them right in the middle. So those kind of uh, departments are placed, so they are essentially a one department, but essentially distributed on the space plan. So I'm, I'm working on that. And then you have regular departments that you place uh, along with other departments which do not have a, a specific requirement in terms of external window or uh, uh, access to this uh, building. So, so I show the public department is essentially the red block over here. You place a tractor point and place, it places the public department there to let users get in the building. Then you have key planning units, which looks like that. Then you have regular modular departments, which are essentially this yellow piece, which does not care about an external window, but still has to be modular like a key planning unit. And then you have regular departments like these orange, gray, and green blocks, which are lower in the order of uh, priority, and then you have regular support departments, which are which is right now in the works, which is essentially the blue piece where you have multiple uh, key planning units, and this thing gets uh, placed right in the middle, so you do not have to walk. So the service uh, person uh, operating the building doesn't have to walk too far, and they are usually distributed uh, across the floor. So these are some of the things that I'm working on. And I'm also working on this concept of this department assemblies, which is essentially using the department adjacencies provided by the user to build a, a, a connected uh, network of departments which needs to be placed together. So for example, if I have six departments, each have IDs 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and on the right I have the adjacencies provided by the user, so for example, department 0 needs to be next to 1, 3, and 5, 1 needs to be next to 0 and 2, and typologies of each department is KPU, public, and regular. So how I compute the assembly is uh, something like that. First, I sort the departments based on First, I will place the public department. So here, the public department was one. So I sort it and place it first. Then I start building the assembly based on the adjacencies of uh, the public department. So the public department had adjacencies zero and two. So I put it there. Uh, and I go to the adjacency of two. So I have one and four. I place it there. And on four, I go to the adjacency of four, which is two and five. I have already placed two, so I do not place it again. Then I place five. And then, uh, essentially, this constitutes a sequence of departments that I need to place one after another. So if I can satisfy this, this uh, essentially satisfies almost 80 to 90% of the adjacency requirements. So this is how assemblies work. Uh, this is right now in progress, and I will soon implement it and push it into the package manager. Mm -hmm. I already showed you the current state of the graph. And these are some of the future steps uh, which I have in mind to work on. First is implementing space plan based on circulation networks. For example, space plans like Peninsula, Pod, or Racetracks, which works good. So yeah, uh, implementing that and placing it. Uh, using that as a means to space, generate space plan could be one of the options. And there could be to add more methods to analyze and appraise space plans. Then probably placing doors to access programs. Then also learning from generated uh, options 
by machine learning. So every design space map option generates an Excel data sheet, which that Excel data sheet could be used for uh, basically acquiring a lot of data for different space plan for a certain uh, depart building type, for example, for hotels, for hospitals. And later, machine learning principles and algorithms can run on top of it, trying to classify which space plan worked and which did not. So probably I didn't show you. Uh, I'll just go back to the Dynamo. And there is in the space analysis, there is this component called export cell data and export department and program data. So basically, these two nodes exports this and from all of cell data information and program and department data information uh, to Excel. So I have as an example, I can show how it works. So what it does is that it generated this Excel file. What it does is that it shows you how many cells uh, this space plan had. So I guess it had uh, around 365 cells. It shows you the types of cells based on the neighborhoods. It shows what program each cell had, the name of the program, the name of the department, and uh, uh, were, were those cells available uh, when we were placing programs. If, there, if, if a certain cell is not assigned yet, it will show not assigned and that is available to be placed further. So all of that could be a building block of further computation to learn from the space plan and implement other, uh, other algorithms. Yeah, that's how, that's where space plan generator is. I would be happy to take questions or for any <laughs> Excellent. Uh, uh, any question? Caesar, are you, uh, CBG, are you going to be able to post one of the example files up with the graph? Yeah, I can do that. Cool. I guess I have one question. From the program data sheet that you had, it looked like you're pretty much relying on an export to CSV, or are you maintaining that live ever, where that spreadsheet is continuously being read through the graph so that if those program requirements are being updated actively for whatever reason, that that can still feed back in and then regenerate the graph? Uh, well, no, uh, Dynamo doesn't operate that way, so it's not live. Uh, so there are two ways how you can get the program data information in. One is to just copy paste uh, uh, information as a string code and use the make data stack from string and add that information in. Or you can use the make data stack uh, node, which does the same thing, but it needs a document path of the CSV file. So all you have to do is provide a path like that. But either way, it's not live. So you make any changes to the CSV it would not, uh, uh, in real time, update the generation. You would have to close the file, save it, and start the generation. You might be able to create a live link with Flux. I was just going to say that, yeah. Have you used Flux? Yeah, you can do that, yeah. yeah. I haven't used uh, lately, but I have heard a lot of good stuff about it. It seems quite doable, that, that route. Yeah, that would be interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Can you explain again how the grid is created? The cell grid? Yeah. Okay, so so essentially, uh, what, uh, let me turn off uh, the, let me go back to the example file I was working on. So, you can turn this off. So the cell grid is essentially computed at this level, find alpha site outline. So what it does is that it finds this uh, cell, uh, this outline with the help of cell grid. So what it does is that it first places cells inside. So placing the cell is uh, pretty straightforward. What it does is that uh, it builds a bounding box uh, for the site outline that it placing. So it builds a bounding box around the site outline and places uh, grid points on it based on dimension that you provide. So after it places grid points, uh, it will go through a point inclusion test. So anything which is inside 
uh, the site outline, any point which is inside the site outline will be accepted and any point which is outside the site outline will be rejected. So essentially what you get is that no matter how convenient your site is, you accurately get a list of points which are right inside. And when you have the points, you can generate cells. So, so cells are basically a uh, uh, collection of uh, four points. So if we go to cell data here, yep. So you will see there's a cell center point. There's a left down corner, and left up corner, right down corner, and right up corner. So these constitute a cell with the dimension that you provide. So with the help of that, it builds the cells. And you can always visualize what you have built. So that's what it built here. But when you place the building outline, it only computes the cell and only accepts those cells that are part of the building outline. So if I use this cell list here, it shows only this many because the building outline is here. So at each level, it computes the cell list again. But at the same time, at each level, when you are generating or computing anything, it uses the previous list. So that's how it is essentially useful. So there's a user and then, uh, dimension for that? Yeah, go ahead. There's a user provided dimension for the, for the cells? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But to make the space plan generator quite fluid, uh, for example, if I have a 3,000 uh, meter long site and I provide a dimension of 0.25, I will have almost more than 12,000 cells, at least. So, so essentially the point is uh, the system keeps track of a maximum and minimum number of cells good enough to make the computation to generate a space plan. So if based on the user's dimension, uh, the number of cells oversees those values, the system will override the cell dimension that you provide and provide a value which is good enough to s output a space plan. That's how it optimizes the speed. So for example, if I, there's a high precision mode, so if I just go here and add in a boolean true, you will see it will generate a lot many cells, so it will be much smaller than what you're seeing. See but it will take more time to compute. Something I just wanted to point out, if you guys noticed how fast that is computing? That was, yeah, I was like, we've seen some big graphs in this group before, yeah. but that's computing a lot of data in a little, very little time. And over the, yeah. And over the Wi-Fi while you're projecting on WebEx, yeah. Yeah, it seems like performance is really good. Is that because of C sharp? He's doing everything with zero touch, yes. Yeah, I think zero touch really speeds up things. And also, as I explained, this uh, dynamo, dynamo primitives nodes, which uh, strips off all the geometry, just a bunch of numbers. So it helps uh, computation uh, very much. So you do not, you are not actually generating 2,000 points. You are actually generating 2,000 numbers, essentially 4,000 numbers, because each point is two numbers. So that's, that speeds up a uh, hell lot more. And also uh, other means like using uh, data structures like binary tree and all, that also helps it uh, access the data fast. Go ahead. Is there a way if the vertical circulation could also be simulated here? For example, uh, I didn't get your question. The yeah. vertical circulation, for example, um, the programs stack up to a certain level and then vertical circulation goes up, but the vertical uh, circulation changes. Yeah, uh, service core, I haven't uh, placed in here yet, but that's also one of the things uh, which I want to work on. Uh, last summer when I worked with Autodesk, I was working on an automated service core generator project. So essentially that was about you give the graph a certain uh, building shell and uh, certain uh, input parameters uh, from the local uh, building codes and it will generate a service uh, core on the building. It was designed specifically for high rise towers because you have multiple elevator banks and you need to drop them at the, just about the right level so that you are not overusing the usable area of the building. So that was all part of that graph, 
uh, currently I have, yeah, I have that here in the Service Pro Modeler. So what it uh, did was it will make a shell or it will get a shell from a STL file. And then it will make a service core and analyze it. And then it will uh, basically render the geometry. Uh, but I used uh, a Python to do that. And these were all essentially custom nodes. So yeah, now my plans were to use the same methodology in here, but as part of C Sharp 0. system and this fit in there and it should work, I guess. Right now, it's not uh, it's not placing any service core. Another way to go about it right now is that you can uh, provide the service core as a department. Say, service core is a department, and you can set its uh, adjacency uh, level high so that it tries to place it next to most of the programs or departments. So that could be another way. Okay, so dovetail off of that would be to include any sort of egress and occupancy into some of the space planning so yeah. the circulation yeah. is sized and the number of exits is generated automatically yeah those could be very well be a uh, part of the workflow definitely do you have is there any input what would you suggest for for that, would that just be an additional value per department, or where would you think to might include that? Oh, um, well, uh, the first input would be uh, the maximum uh, dimension that you are allowed to be away from a service core. For example, let's say 20 feet, you cannot be away from a more than 20 feet uh, from a service core. So the system can actually check the whole space plan and see if any corner is away from t away is more than 20 feet from service core it has to uh, lay out the service core such that it satisfies that so that could be one of the metric another metric could be to distribute the load so for example for uh, building the different uh, for example l shaped or u shaped building and you might have different heights for each wing so based on the buildable area that each wing satisfies, your service core uh, dimension would be different because uh, the number of uh, elevator bands would be different, number of technical rooms would be different, or your elevator lobbies would be different. So that could be another input. So yeah, these are some some of the some of inputs from the user, and also some of the things that could be automated. So. Uh, the code can really compute it for you. That's what actually the service core modeler package uh, does. Cool. I'm curious about how, like, as you mentioned, you have already applied that um, to a real project in Perkins Will. And I'm curious how you work with the design team. Like, do you work directly with the BIM manager? or with designer or how, how do you deal with that? Because as we can see, like there are many steps and um, it has to have like a very organized way to make it happen. So it may take like a designer or um, be manager a week to, to sort it out, to gather the data and put into the workflow and understand the process. But it may just take a medical planner half a day to generate two or three options that really make sense. So I'm really wondering like how you will vision your um, application to the real industry um, in the in the very um, very close future. So I'm sorry, uh, your voice was uh, cracking in between. I couldn't get so most of it. Uh, I'll, can I'll can you repeat? OK. Um, we actually, that was part of what we addressed when we were working with CBG and pairing up. So the way we resolved that was we paired up a computational designer with a planner. And it, it, it helped quite a bit. It gave the feedback in both directions. Um, but then we were also projecting forward how could we put this into the hands of the designer directly. And part of that was the impl implementation of Fractal using the, um, I forget the, uh, the slide graphs that we have. I'll show you that a few minutes later um, so that basically packaged the whole thing up and put it into the hands of the users where they can mess with the, the slides and kind of see graphically immediately the output of that 
um, the idea of or the information data dimensions. Yeah, I mean, it kind of gave you. I'll, I'll show you at the end. I'm not specifically for space time, but for another one. But you can basically start to narrow your inputs graphically, and it'll start to narrow. The, it'll generate like a thousand results, and then as you start to narrow the inputs, it narrows it down to like two or three. So um, what do the architectural designers do? It just needs the users and then they're the validating database. using experience to validate the options that are generated. Um, so the computational designer would help set up the process and take that feedback in from the, the designers initially, but then the, the designers are validating the number of options. We really kind of saw this as a um, idea generator. Mm -hmm. um, future, the idea was to potentially add um, machine learning to it so that a, uh, much like a Google search of images, you click on, you do an image search of what you like, then you click on one of them and say, you know, I, I want more of those, show me more of those, and there's kind of a rabbit trail you can go down with that. Is same idea as where as you could start to teach the algorithm that, you know, I like this, show me more, rerun the graph around these parameters, do it again. And so take, you know, 12,000 runs, narrow it down to 100 runs, narrow it down to 20 runs based on user input of preference. That's cool. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be like challenging or. No, that's a very good I, question. I, yeah, I totally see the future because, I mean, this is totally, um, this is totally relevant and cool. Um, but but at, at this stage, I just feel like, like how, how would it be better just to try to improve the implementation of the program and the practicality of, of these kind of useful things? Because apparently nowadays we have the senior, the very experienced medical planners and designers who can just sit down and work on the paper for one day and generate like two or three really validate that validate um, options instead of like go through all the learning curves and do all the steps and um, setting up the system and then generate like ten options that have this or that flaws in it. Um, but I mean, I I understand the future and um, it's just. So what we're doing right now, we have a couple of projects that are actually using this actively and we're running a parallel track. We're doing both, we're comparing them, um, and we're trying to improve the process for right now. Um, cool. <laughs> yeah, we understand you need output work, but we also understand that we need to develop, we're, at some point we're not gonna be able to keep up with the pace of design, so we have to start planning for that now. sense for doing the evaluation as opposed to expert systems? I'm not the best person to answer that. <laughs> That's a good question. But we have a couple of people looking into it. Yeah, machine learning is good for classifying objects like, for example, the best example for machine learning is how you can uh, predict if the email is uh, spam or not. So similar to that, machine learning can be really used for space plan to classify does it work or does it not. So there are different algorithms to do that. One could be uh, decision trees. And decision trees essentially set of questions that you ask, like uh, if this uh, space plan has a lobby, yes. If this space plan, if the lobby is accessible uh, from the main street, you say yes. If uh, the lobby is accessible to other rooms, you say no. Then probably this baseline doesn't work. So these uh, are some of the really, really simplified uh, examples of decision trees. So there, every, every level you ask a question and there's a yes and no answer. And based on that, you select a sub-branch of the tree. And there are different ways to go into different uh, branches of the tree. There could be depth for, uh, depth, uh, first search or breadth first search way. So there, there are different ways to go about it and uh, there are different uh, types of decision trees available. And it basically differs from cases to cases. You have to actually measure the uh, efficiency of the results. So you, you can classify, you can really test uh, how many classifications were actually right. 
So sometimes it would be like 80% of the time the machine learning algorithm was right that yeah, that space plan was not good and actually it was not good. Or maybe only 30% of the time it was uh, right. So you have to pick the algorithm uh, which works for that particular case. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, uh, exploratory, exploratory uh, area. You have to implement different ways and find what works best for you. What is your recommendation as far as uh, outputs into Revit for documentation? Uh, what? Like uh, well, design options into uh, Revit. Uh, the best way uh, you can get it, I guess, uh, you can just export it into DWG and it exports uh, uh, into different layers. So the labels are different layers and the polylines would be different layers. And I guess from DWG you can really get into Revit. I haven't tried a direct uh, uh, direct uh, way of getting this straight into Revit. I haven't been working in the Revit version of Dynamo. It's Dynamo Studio. Uh, my idea was to make it really, really fast and not to rely on any of the other APIs than the ones that I have with me. But yeah, that could be something that I can explore and see some other route. But at this state, it exports uh, the whole space plan, including the labels, as DWG document. Cool. Well, I'm going to quickly show Fractal. I know we're kind of over time, but I'll just give you a taste of it and where to find it, and you guys can explore further. So, um, Project Fractal is up and live. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get CVG's uh, newest graph up here, but if you go to uh, home.projectfractal live, um, they've got a couple examples up there. You can sign up. They've got a few things up there. It's very much like um, the Send to Web from uh, Dynamo Studio. But the advantage that you get is that you start to get all the permutations possible. And much like the Design Space uh, Explorer, you can start to mess with refining these by simply dragging a few values down to, you know, this is what I want. You can start to regenerate, run the graph right in the web by adjusting a few things here, reevaluating. So this is where you can start to take something like what CVG has and start to redefine the graph live right in the web and to kind of pinpoint a large data set. And the best part is you can download. No. <laughs> download the Dynamo Graph, download the CSV, or download the STL. Multiple people can collaborate in one. Uh, I don't know yet. Um, yeah, we've been working with something like this in house. Um, they just released this. In fact, it was announced at RTC for the first time. We were working with it the day before. Um, with the space plan, so it this is literally Since hot off the press. Since it's on website, yeah. online, does it work? Yeah. It makes sense. Sorry, what was the question? So it's like multiple people can collaborate in one picture. Multiple people. Yeah, I don't think so at this point. Like Google Doc. I don't think so at this point, but I could do it. But we found that with some of these newer applications where you're generating hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of options, you can't process all that data one by one. You need, uh, you need a whole other system for being able to do this. So we're using the parallel plot coordinates, as these are called, um, is, are really helping in a lot of scenarios. It's coming up 
um, in Fractal, it's been uh, coming up with the honeybee and what Mustafa has been doing. Um, and we've been using it in-house at Perkins Well for quite a few things. So these like graph elements here, these are um, <coughs> resultants or uh, sliders within the Dynamo graph that then yep. get rendered as this. Yep. Is there a formatting that you have to maintain so that it recognizes and makes that translation or? The simple thing that you're doing when you have Dynamo Studio open is you right click on it and say is input. Is input. Yeah. There little checkbox, just like preview. Let's see if I can uh, pull it up. But you need Dynamo Studio to do this. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. This is one big yeah. difference. You used to be able to have the standalone for free. It's still there. It's it? under Dynamo Revit um, as Sandbox. On Dynamo BIM? Yep. So if you go to the C drive, uh, program files, Dynamo. You'll see the big change with some of the last re releases that you'll get both of these. Set they separate out the core from the Revit. Uh -huh. And the sandbox is hiding under the Revit. Uh, <laughs> but it's still there. Okay, yeah, because I was looking for that. I know, that was my first reaction like, too. What you really did that without telling anyone? Yeah, it's still there. You can still use okay. it. So if I throw one of these things out, but that doesn't work the same way as Studio. It doesn't have the export. Yeah, uh, let's do a string. A slider. Yeah, so if you right click and see the show it, uh, is input, mm -hmm. that's what will show up in the graph. By default, that's on, so you'll need to turn it off for anything you don't want showing up. Gotcha. The one big limiter right now is that it can't accept third-party packages unless they are whitelisted, so you'll have to contact the Autodesk team. So everything has to be inside of Dynamo. Um, it can't call outside files. Um, they're working on that mm. quite actively. And um, CBG's package actually was white, was one of the few that are actually whitelisted right now. What is whitelisted? Um, because putting a package up can open a basically a black hole to their server, they are not just allowing anything to go up. They have to manually check it, and so it needs to be validated by them. So there's certain packages that they will whitelist. And also one more thing, they do not uh, factory doesn't take in Python. Yep. So right now you cannot script anything in Python in there. And another thing is, uh, just like inputs, you can also have So you can use a watch node to output any information. For example, the design score for a space plan could be output. And in the parallel coordinates plot, it will show as an orange line. So anything orange line up there would be output. So you can just use a watch node to get output a, any information, any number or anything. I can show up there. Great. So yeah, that's up. Get, get yours. <laughs> get yours. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. It's been a, it's a great uh, information, uh, great tools uh, on the works. Uh, thanks for sharing with us. Uh, just one more thing because before I break the session, next next meeting, uh, it's. Uh, the topic is uh, Gensler work. Uh, it's going to be announced in a couple of weeks. Uh, stay tuned uh, at HOK uh, again. Um, and uh, I just want to give a big applause to the presenters. So. Uh, I don't see any uh, questions on the chat line. Uh, and with that, uh, I just want to invite you to continue the social out there with the food that's left over and the wine. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, and see you next time. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>